welcome to Conversations with Dr. Stephen Greer. And uh, I'd like to thank the people at the World Puja Network for hosting us here every two weeks to bring you an update to uh, what we're doing with DisclosureProject.org and CSETI.org and the OrionProject.org, which are projects we work on to bring out the information that we are not alone in the universe and that it's possible for us to make contact and bring out the new and advanced sciences and technologies to make us a completely new civilization on this planet. And I'm um, really excited to bring to you today Dr. Jan Bravo, who's on the board of directors of the Center for the Study of Extraterrestrial Intelligence and Disclosure Project. Uh, thank you, Jan, for joining us. Hello. It's nice to be here. Oh, good. And so what we're going to focus on, we just returned in the past week from an expedition training under the stars out in the deserts of uh, Southern California. And as many of you know uh, from hearing pro previous programs, uh, we do these four or five times a year, and uh, there are times when we gather together to train people in the contact protocols. And uh, these protocols have been developed over the last, well, actually 40 years uh, uh, of contact of uh, with extraterrestrial civilizations. And uh, what we're doing is to share this information with the public so that people can go out and make their own contact teams. Uh, as all of you know who've gone to DisclosureProject.org, there's overwhelming evidence that we're being visited by intelligent civilizations, notwithstanding uh, recent uh, statements from the government to the contrary. And uh, many co countries around the world have begun to release their files and open their files to the fact that uh, we have been observing uh, extraterrestrial vehicles and have a huge amount of evidence to this effect. What hasn't happened yet is... Uh, an open governmental diplomatic contact program to uh, welcome these visitors to this planet within a universal peace. And this is a huge problem because uh, we're now uh, more than 50, 60 years into the modern era of contact and uh, documented landings and sightings. And the result, of course, is that we have... Uh, a civilization that uh, has governments that are completely dysfunctional on this issue. The secrecy has gone on for much too long. The science and technology behind uh, this whole issue has been kept secret because obviously these objects that people have seen aren't using fossil fuels to zip around. They're using very advanced transdimensional physics. And most importantly, the uh, operations that have been dealing with this are highly classified, illegal, and at this point rogue operations that have taken a, a very militaristic approach to the problem and to the situation. So what we're doing at the Center for the Study of Extraterrestrial Intelligence, which is described at CSETI.org, is to say, all right, they're here, we're here, how do we make contact in a way that's peaceful, uh, that brings in the concepts of universal peace, and how would that contact go forward? And so we train people to become ambassadors, uh, citizen ambassadors, from Earth to these civilizations at these expeditions. And, and that's what we've just completed is a week of, of this sort of program out in the desert of California. And it was amazing what took place on many, many levels, which we'll share over the course of the next hour. So... Um, I think before we get into that, for people who are new to the program, I just want to introduce the concepts of, of what we're doing, and that is, first, uh, to understand how one might communicate with these civilizations, you have to understand how they might be communicating. And this means getting out of the box of uh, 20th century and early 21st century uh, radio signals and cell phone signals. Uh, because if you think about it for just a moment, uh, let's say that uh, there's a civilization from the Andromeda galaxy visiting Earth, which there is. Um, that's two and a half million light years from here. Uh, now, that's uh, a huge distance. That's the distance, uh, a beam of light uh, going at 186,000 miles per second, every second, 186,000 miles, that it would take two and a half million years for that beam of light to go from Earth to the Andromeda galaxy. 
and another two and a half million to come back. So communicating at the speed of light, which would be radio signals, uh, microwave signals, uh, cell phones, et cetera, that would take five million years round trip just to say, hello, how are you? Fine, thank you very much. Now, that's obviously a paradigm that's absurd and isn't going to happen. Uh, even with our own galaxy, our galaxy is 100,000 uh, light years across. Well, uh, it just isn't going to be possible from one side of the galaxy to the other to spend 200,000 years each time you want to have a two-way conversation. What we discovered, and this was through a number of experiences I had when I was um, – doing meditation, and when I was 18 years of age, and this is why I love talking about this at the World Puja Network, because everyone listening understands the science of consciousness and, and the, the, the science of the Vedas. Um, and I was doing meditation, and I developed with these extraterrestrial civilizations through a contact I had uh, a protocol for using thought within the construct of expanded awareness and universal mind to make contact. And it turns out they have electronic systems that interface with coherent, directed, clear thought that's as accurate as you and I talking on our iPhones or Blackberries. So it's a very precise science, even though it's a new science. It's a science of consciousness. But it's the science of consciousness meets space age, interstellar, transdimensional electronics. And that's what we're teaching is how what the interface is between the ancient knowledge of mind and the science of consciousness and thought and these extraterrestrial civilizations and then all the different ways that they can contact us, not only through thought, but through electronics, sightings, all kinds of experiences. So the core and the heart of understanding this uh, protocol which we call the Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind initiative, CE5 initiative. And a Close Encounter of the Fifth Kind is simply when humans decide we're going to make contact with the ETs and communicate bilaterally instead of just passively seeing one fly through the air. And so this is a, a whole new category of Close Encounters, and uh, it, it involves humans empowering themselves to say, okay, we're not alone in this cosmos, and we're conscious, and every single human being, by virtue of being aware, can be aware of awareness. And going into the meditative state, um, through a number of techniques that, that we teach, you can experience that state of, of unboundedness and pure mind, and then within that, begin to see remotely the extraterrestrial civilizations or people or spacecraft in your awareness and in your mind's eye, and then communicate with them through very clear, directed thought and show them where you are. So, for example, we might be out in the desert of California, sitting in a very remote place, which is where we were last week, and we will do a meditation and then expand awareness into space and connect to uh, these extraterrestrial civilizations, whatever it is that people may have come to their minds, and then show them where we are. So if we're in California in the southern uh, part of the state in the desert, uh, east of uh, San Diego, we'll sh zoom in from space and show them our solar system and then Earth and North America and the West Coast and then zoom in precisely, literally, the exact appearance of the site, like you would on Google Earth or something, but you're doing it mentally. And we set this up along with some other protocols using lasers that we send up. We have a laser that goes about 200 to 300 miles into space, and we have radio signals that are um, sent. There's sort of uh, tones that were recorded in the crop circles that I got from Colin Andrews, um, who coined the term crop circle, who's a very dear friend of mine, uh, back in the early 90s. And it's a series of tones. And also there are some other C-SETI tones from when we were up on Mount Shasta, where an extraterrestrial vehicle came through and made this sound that created an image in everyone's minds. And those tones are sent over radio signals so that in case people's minds aren't crystal clear, they at least can get a linear fix with the laser and the tone. So those three things, sound through the electronics, uh, the light through the lasers, and then our thought, those three modalities are used 
to show the ETs where we are. And actually, this entire protocol is now on an iPhone app uh, at the uh, App Store for if you have a, an Apple um, iPhone or, or, or a, an um, iPad. Or an iPad, yes. yes. What's exciting about this is it's just the next step in the GPS. It's a consciousness-assisted global positioning system, and it works. It's it's a new technology that is here now, and um, I would I would advise if you go to the site and read about these apps, they do work. the The protocols work because people all over the world are using them. In fact, we had people at this conference from Germany, from England, from Malaysia, as well as all over the United States. So it was quite an exciting training and expedition. Right. Exactly. So, you know, that's um you know, that's the kind of thing where that that what I think people have to understand is that when we we have this uh, these sort of expeditions our intent is sort of the philosophy behind it is um to to create universal peace through open contact as citizen ambassadors. And uh what we're finding is that now that there are thousands of people who've been trained to do this all over the world, there's a growing level of contact with all of the contact teams. And I, I talk about a great deal this this concept of morphogenic fields that Rupert Sheldrake uh, first brought forward. But, you know, it's an old concept of the 100th monkey effect. And once a certain number of people begin to do something like this, it creates its own uh, power and its own uh, momentum. And that's what we're seeing happening with our contact teams that now span. We had people at this expedition from Malaysia and from Germany and from England and from all over the place. And 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 so it's a very, very exciting project because it empowers a change in direction of our society on the consciousness level uh, and on the level of, of non-local mind that can be very, very powerful uh, and when you have 20 some people out under the stars doing this every night, it creates its own shift in, in consciousness, even for people who aren't there. And so one of the purposes of doing this is that it's a very empowering process, not just for people who are, who are actually there, but it actually causes a, a shift in the morphogenic field that I think is what creates a new reality uh, and moves us from the current situation where we have the dominant paradigm on this subject is fear and paranoia and uh, suppression of information and secrecy into something that's open, uh, disclosure, contact, and uh, a peaceful approach to these extraterrestrial civilizations. And so that's very much what we're focused on, on doing. And that's the sort of a quick overview of what the CE5 initiative is. And, and we have these expeditions, uh, as I mentioned, four or five times a year. We're planning to do one again in Arizona in the desert um, in February, the end of February, early March. And um, we're, we've, we're actually about to, to nail down a site that's adjacent to a five million acre national forest. That'll be awesome. And um, so that just keep uh, tuned. Those of you who want to join us, um, we should have the details up fairly soon the next week or two at CSETI.org. Um, and then we'll also be at uh, uh, Marco Island in the Gulf of Mexico in uh, um, April of this year. And uh, we have a state beach that uh, we've engaged that just for our group. It's closed to the public. And when we were there this past uh, March is when we had this whole emergence of uh, a huge number of transdimensional craft that kept appearing on the beach and right over the shoreline. But they were in these lit forms, almost like plasma-like, brilliant white lights, uh, and we actually filmed a great many of these. These we're going to hopefully get out uh, in a new book and DVD fairly soon. And uh, the people who were there, it was just astonishing. By the way, that contact event went on for three and a half hours. So it wasn't something that was a transient thing just seen. It went on and on and on and on. It was amazing. And what we're finding with these expeditions is that the contact is happening at, you know, in more intimate ways, but in ways that are quite mysterious. Um, most people think of a movie like, um, you know, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, and they think of a 
fully materialized spacecraft landing and someone coming out and shaking your hand. And actually, while there have been fully materialized craft and there have been ET beings that have been seen very near our group, it's more likely that they stay in a trans-dimensional form. And what that means is that they stay in an energetic form that can be seen, but is not at all what most people are expecting. And this is a pretty steep learning curve for most people who are first learning about this subject. But it's very important to understand that if you're going from one star system to another, you're literally, if those of you who understand the Vedic cities will understand this, you're dematerializing, but you're doing it with electronics from one place and then rematerializing in another, or you can stay in that dematerialized form in sort of a trans-dimensional energy field. And that energy field has specific electronic and visual manifestations, and that's what we're filming and picking up on our electronic detectors and our uh, magnetic field meters and uh, radar detectors and other systems that we have out on the site with us. And it's quite amazing to be out in the middle of as we were this past week uh, on 700,000 acres of wilderness and all of a sudden we have these electronic devices going off in a very much in like in a conversation it's very very conversational it's not even something these detectors would normally do and we're in extremely remote locations so i think that's pretty exciting and uh, i don't know jan if you want to talk about what some of the things that happened because you were you were recording right. these with the audio system actually there is one, one one thing just to expand on what you just said we have found we used to just have radar detectors um well we found as we have more technological devices dts have been communicating through more devices we have the magnetometers we have the radar detectors we have a storm tracker the tracks of magnetic activity in each one of these um, through each of these we've recorded um, pulsings and and sounds that come through in a way that these devices do not usually work in fact we've had physicists say that some of them are Fibonacci sequences uh, it's been truly astounding we find that there are numbered sequences of beeps and pulses right. which these are not meant to make and do not we've, we've had them out on the road or had them doing their normal functions and they never ever make these pulsings and um, it, we found that when we are in contact they are the the sequences are not random and they're mathematical sequences and we're analyzing them and um, we have a whole new batch from this past training to analyze to see what we might be able to find from them. Right, right. Yeah, Well, that, and that's what's exciting is that um, it's, it, there were also a number of objects that we're seeing, and we'll go over that in, over the next few minutes. Um, and I think that uh, what, one of the things that people have to understand when you start going into an interstellar mindset is they are not required to fulfill our preconceived prejudices about how they might manifest. And in other words, their reality is their reality. And our reality is that currently we're using technologies that are pretty much locked in the late 1800s paradigm of uh, electromagnetic theory, uh, although classified programs have much more advanced uh, systems. It's not known by the public. In fact, there's a senior scientist for the U.S. government that Dr. Bravo and I have met with, and you know, who has described a uh, experimental work they've done where they've had pulsed uh, resonant communication systems at m multiples of the speed of, of light, uh, but it's been in a classified lab. So what we know is that. Uh, the interstellar civilizations, many of whom have been here, I believe, for millions of years and certainly thousands of years, uh, and some of the really ancient ones, millions of years, are so developed. And uh, the concept here is that the consciousness flows from the level, the, the technology flows from the level of consciousness. So some of these civilizations are in a state of cosmic consciousness and God consciousness and very, very enlightened, and their sciences and technologies flow from that level of consciousness, even though they live, have material worlds and material spacecraft. The spacecraft themselves, for example, are conscious nanobiomachines, meaning that they are consciousness 
and they are living. And this gets into a whole discussion then of what we might expect when we have set up a, con a contact protocol and we begin having really what some people consider bizarre, uh, and which for us is the new norm, uh, contact that simply is not something that you would see in, in, in a Hollywood movie, is, but it's actually more fantastic and wonderful and beautiful and intimate. Uh, and, and it has to do with the fact that civilizations that can travel beyond the speed of light go through this crossing point of light into dimensions that the mystics would have called the astral or the etheric um, and perhaps even the celestial, the ones that are extremely developed. And so their technologies are all emanating from that trans-dimensional interstellar level. I call it TDIS for short. And the trans-dimensional interstellar level of science and technology means that they can be right there on site with us and what you'll be seeing is a field distortion that looks like the shape of a spacecraft. But you can see straight through it because it's not fully materialized. Meanwhile, our electronic detectors and everything are going crazy, are talking as if they're in the circuitry of the electronics making these sounds. And then there'll be these brilliant lights that will appear in the sky, but also in the field around us. I mean, and sometimes inside our circle, I mean, it's a small circle of 20-some people, and we'll have these, these brilliant objects just light up right in the center of the circle. And within that light is sort of an electronic teleportation of these beams that are then there. So it's an amazing thing to behold because you see it with your naked eye and you also see it in consciousness, and you can feel it. And it's uh, this level of contact has been really going up and up exponentially over the last two or three years. And um, so, and, and it continued certainly to escalate in a wonderful way um, in, in the desert of California uh, uh, in the past week or two. Um, I will say that uh, just to uh, uh, affirm what you said earlier, part of it is the intent that we bring. It's a peaceful intent. We're not asking them to perform for us. We are interacting with them, and they appreciate that uh, because it's a true interaction. And part of it is that we have to be there in consciousness. We have to have a, a basically pure intent, and then things happen. And as you said, so much has happened, and with the newer cameras and devices we've gotten, now we're capturing things that are so rapid that um, it, it – they're almost hard to describe, but people can see. But now, on, with some of the new digital devices, they capture these uh, wonderful colors and shapes and craft. And um, we we now have that um, as evidence and as data, and that's exciting. Well, uh, if you want, do you want to share some of the specific things that happened, Jan, over the course of the week uh, while we were out? Um, yeah, we had. I, I will say there. We've talked about um, the electronic devices, but there are also other anomalous things that happened. Um, as you recall, uh, a few nights were rather windy, right. and we had a wind of a ground speed of perhaps 20 miles per hour. Well, at one point, someone pointed out a single cloud in the sky, and we watched it over a period of time. And with the wind at that ground speed of 20 miles per hour, it had to be higher up where this cloud was. The cloud was low, and it was the only cloud in the sky, and the cloud didn't move for a very long period of time. And that was just, uh, we were having a lot of activity going on. And as we know, sometimes craft will, will hide themselves or shield themselves or just kind of be there with a cloud around them. Right, and this was one that uh, it should have been moving at 40 or 60 knots uh, at the elevation where it was, and it was shaped like a disc. And yes. and yes. so it, it was very, very odd. Uh, of course, allegedly it was a cloud. And, you know, I tell people that one of the great uh, photographs over the last 30 or 40 years was one taken by a Navy captain of, of what looked to be a cloud that was, but it was actually materializing itself. And on the edge of it, you could see the rim of a silver disc. And this craft was actually making a cloud around it. So um, you never know. And one of the things that, that it, it's uh, uh, 
<laughs> to understand about this is also we while we were out there every night we had multiple uh, military aircraft descending right over the site and some of them putting their landing lights or lights right into the site and right at us uh, which is not unusual when we do this uh, you know there's sort of a uh, multiple things happening at once. There's our contact team. There's the ETs that we have invited who do manifest in various ways. And then you have the military and classified programs that are, quite frankly, spying on us and sometimes send assets such as aircraft and even troops nearby. Um, we have had people come in with lights off on camo with people you know, in the woods watching us. Um, and that sounds spooky to some people. And it, it, it's not. I mean, they're basically, you would expect this to be the case because one of the things that people don't realize is that when I first started being asked to brief folks like the CIA director on this kind of thing, it was mainly because they knew that we had figured out the Rosetta Stone of contact. And 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 that was the big concern. The head of Army Intelligence pulled me aside and said, and basically said that. And th they really were, were uh, amazed that we'd figured that out. And I said, well, it was something because of contact that happened when I was 18 years of age. By the way, that's described in this book, Hidden Truth, Forbidden Knowledge, if you want to read the account of how all this came about. Um, after a near-death experience I had, and then a, uh, an experience in uh, meditation, I learned uh, meditation and, and had this amazing samadhi experience. And from that, began to understand the Vedas and the, the whole nature of the conscious universe. And so the the, the military actually do understand these things, I mean, at the very senior classified level. And so you have that going on at the same time. So frequently we'll have the extraterrestrial uh, civilizations and people or craft materialize in very enigmatic, strange ways, very rapidly, um, or in ways that are not fully in this dimension, but you can see them and the detectors see them and the cameras will photograph them, but they're not there where you could go and kick the side of a, you know, a metal spacecraft. And this is actually what you would expect because unfortunately we're not living at a time where um, we have universal peace. We're living at a time where we have a lot of very powerful uh, classified military assets that have targeted and shot at these objects and uh, one time in our present um, uh, at Mount Shasta. Uh, and that's recounted in this new book that came out uh, a couple years ago called uh, A Contact Countdown the Transformation, uh, which is at disclosureproject.org. And, and I think that what people have to understand is that we're doing this as citizen diplomats and citizen ambassadors within the context of the current world reality. And that means that we go to places like this, very remote area, and we have military aircraft overhead uh, at very low altitude, uh, descending and sometimes putting their, their uh, lights, landing lights and what have you, uh, onto the area. Um, and it, I, it's alarming to some people. It's not to me because you expect this. In fact, at Marco Island, when we had uh, this amazing event take place, the next night there was a chopper that came exactly over that area of the beach, very low altitude, that was loaded with some kind of weird electronic warfare systems that, that you could see. And we actually filmed that, and it just flew right over the area. And uh, this would be something right out of a movie. You couldn't make it up. And uh, it didn't surprise any of us that that took place because we're certain that the high-tech satellites that are up there were imaging this event as it was occurring. Um, the night before, and uh, so there, there's this interplay uh, that, that's going on, and uh, we hope someday that that uh, this silly phase of human development will pass and will become just uh, peaceful, uh, coexisting with our fellow planetary neighbors. But at this time, you know, you you have to also be aware that there are, um, you know, military classified programs that monitor the situation. You know, I remind people that in uh, one of the documents that got released accidentally in the late 70s from Canada was a, um, a memo from Wilbur Smith, and it was describing, uh, and it was a memo from the 50s, I think it was 1951, where he's summarizing what was going on in the United States dealing with these extraterrestrial issues. 
And it says, and this is actually in the disclosure book, and it, the, the book disclosure, uh, that's the summary of all the top secret military and documents we have at disclosureproject.org. And, and the memo clearly states that, um, that they were real and that there was a secret project being headed up by Dr. Vannevar Bush, who also headed up the Manhattan Project uh, for developing the first atomic bomb, and that a group of elite scientists were working on it and that it was the most classified program within the United States and it exceeded the secrecy surrounding the development of the hydrogen bomb. So, and this memo was a year before we detonated the first hydrogen bomb at Bikini Atoll. So if that was the case in 1951, imagine what now, 60 years later, um, the level of secrecy and the, ma the level of reconnaissance and assets that have gone into it. I mean, literally, I'm not exaggerating when I say trillions of dollars have gone into this issue. And so when a group like ours goes out and we're, you know, a relatively unfunded citizen diplomatic ambassador effort, you can bet on the fact that there's going to be this kind of reconnaissance. But what's wonderful is that the ETs find ways to manifest it doesn't matter. You know, we have objects that appear right in the circle, right around us, right in the sky over us, through the electronic devices, which should be completely silent in a remote location like that. And they're picking up the, and it's actually a conversation taking place. The tonality of the magnetic field meter, uh, when there's a being that's literally standing amongst us and being right beside us, is astonishing to hear and see. And it's just amazing and then above us there'll be some craft that will be signaling way up high like it did one night we were out there and there was actually at one point uh well visible with the naked eye three craft that were above us up in the sky that were uh signaling and at one point with the night scopes i could see six of them and this was straight up above us and um i forget which night that was but um uh, it was a couple weeks ago now yeah and we've also documented things like temperature changes, where when there's a craft around us, everyone will be wearing their coat. It'll be some temperature. And all of a sudden, people are taking their coats off because everyone notes that there is a temperature change. And, in fact, we have measurement devices, and we'll see the temperature has changed 10, 20, 30 degrees right where we are. And there's nothing to account for it um, terrestrially, let's put it that way. Right, right, yeah. When we had this um, ET that appeared, which uh, in, in uh, last year, uh, two years ago, uh, almost now, in um, Joshua Tree, um, we had uh, this uh, orb that appeared, and then it flashed, and it created a cone of light, and in that cone of light uh, is this ET being uh, that we were told is from the Andromeda system, and you can clearly see it in the photograph. And... That created a situation where there was an energy field around us where these beings and some kind of trans-dimensional energy field where it went from, I believe, 36 degrees out in the desert to 69. We were yes. literally peeling our coats off. Yes, it was and, measured. And, and when we left that night from that site, mm -hmm. a few hundred yards away, it was in the 30s mm -hmm. again. And this is bizarre. And people go, how can this be? I said, well, you have to understand trans-dimensional physics how there can be a craft on site that's dematerialized but present and, and all the effect that we're seeing with the cameras because now we have these really high-tech night vision cameras and uh, also really good still cameras that are the best Nikon, uh, you know, whatever they are, 16 and 21 megapixel, and also these recording devices and electronics and all of this activity is being documented that's within, it's not out in space, it's within feet of us or around us, that there is an actual presence there, and it's very transdimensional, and it turns out that that's very safe for them and for us because every time we've had one fully materialized within minutes, we have a very low-altitude military chopper or, um, or a jet come in uh, and come straight over our group and circle the group, even if we're in a national park or in a remote area or state park or what have you. So what we found is that we have to begin to understand what the reality is of a faster-than-the-speed-of-light civilization. And it's a little bit like, you know, if we were to go back, I don't know, 200 years and show Thomas Jefferson an iPhone or a smartphone, 
it'd be sorcery. I mean, you know, if you're in Salem, Massachusetts, I guess they'd burn you at the stake of the witch. Um, and, you know, we're talking about a leap in technology that's certainly more than the 200-year leap that we've gone from, uh, you know, the early 1800s to now. And yet we, we're having contact, and we have to begin to understand how is conscious contact going to take place and how is it going to take place in a way that we'll all understand. And obviously when the craft fully materializes, and we have actually some very good images, I think, from this expedition of these uh, several crafts that were above us up in the sky that were there signaling for a number, I don't know, maybe 20 minutes. Yeah. Um, I think both video cameras got that from what I understand. Yes. Yeah. And uh, also, the last night we were out, there were two craft that materialized uh, after we did a puja. This was on the World Puja Network. One of the parts of our um, protocol is that I didn't used to do this, but now I'll each night, um, if, if it's possible, and the weather isn't just crazy, try to do. Uh, um, I'll try to do a puja in Sanskrit, and then we'll sit in meditation, and then we'll start the protocol of remote viewing and contact. And it was after we had done all that that there were these two craft, one that was bluish white and one that was kind of golden amber that appeared in the east um, after we, we did the puja and the, and the meditation. And, um, you know, so, and I'm pretty sure that those are also got filmed. Yes, yes. And, um, and everyone saw them. And every, this is something everyone saw. Um, and there was a great deal of very specific electronic activity through uh, the magnetometers. Now, for people who don't know what this is, by the way, when you get the app uh, for your iPhone, if you have one, and unfortunately we don't have it for Android or other smartphones yet, but um, it, it actually turns your iPhone into a magnetometer as well. Um, this app is amazing and genius that Todd that Goldenbaum did. Um, and so you can go to the App Store and, and get that. That's the C-SETI contact app. And what's interesting is that a magnet, magnetometer is basically something that picks up the field flux in the magnetic field. So let's say that you uh, are out in the middle of nowhere. You zero it to whatever the background magnetic field is, and it should pretty much stay there. However, if you were to take it over to like a motor or something, it would begin to go off. So we're out there and we're out without any motors. And in fact, what I do is I go around and zero it and test all the equipment we have. And, and there's nothing we have that will make this go off unless it's within four to six inches of it, even the, 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 the boom boxes we have for playing the tones and the camera motors and all that stuff. And... What's interesting is that we'll have these, and then we'll have a, a, an object begin to be seen and contact happen, and they'll begin to go off. And, it, and they don't go off like they do with a mechanical motor. They go off in a way that sounds, frankly, conversational, because they are. And it's, I know it sounds very bizarre, but it's transdimensional electronics. And this is something with a magnetic field. And what they're doing, they're getting inside the circuitry and the magnetic field flux of the area and I can actually walk around the circle where we can see the sort of a luminous field and walk over to it, and they'll begin to go off. And it's very, very specific. Um, and so one of the tasks also then is to feel or to sense what it is that they're communicating, because obviously they're not speaking English, but you can feel it. And it's more something of developing your intuitive ability and, and your sense of feeling, which everyone has, and it's a big part of the training program is to go into these higher states of consciousness where you can then intuit and feel the kind of communication that happens. But these electronic devices are doing this regardless of whether someone has developed that ability or not. But what happens when, it, when these begin to communicate is that it will be very, very specific and we'll find that there will be different species that will make different types of patterns. And um, some, it, it, you know, you almost have to hear it to believe it because you're out there where nothing should be doing this. And it's not just the magnetic field meters, but also we have uh, radar and laser detectors like you'd use to pick up things from police cars going by. There are no police cars out there. We're in a remote site in a 700,000-acre park, and they will begin to do very specific communication and uh, go off. And this happened... 
over and over. And, well, it was nightly, actually. Right. And only, as you said, um, if, if there were something that would set them off, it should, be, it should set them all off. But one specifically will be um, communicating with us. It, it, it's just an amazing thing to behold, actually. And the other thing is, which is wonderful, there are certain sequences or um, uh, tones that seem to be the same thing, such as an affirmative statement, uh, an, an affirmative um, backup to something that someone has said, something that you have said maybe, or someone else has said in the circle that's of import. We'll hear the same tone and know that they're saying, yes, that's right. And um, it, it's... Uh, it's really exciting communication, but we're we're still analyzing all that's going on, and we just get new things every time. Yes, yeah, so, you know the idea that the picture we're trying to share is that there are objects that are seen, and there are craft that materialize. There are lights and orbs and objects that come around the circle, and then we have these electronic devices and cameras picking up things that are very specific that may be beyond what the human eye can see. Remember, the human eye only sees a certain spectrum and a certain frequency of light, and uh, the optic nerve and the neurons can only see. However, some of the new technologies that are in these uh, very high-tech digital cameras will pick up things that, that are more uh, subtle and, and or faster than the human eye can see, and that's what we're beginning to get. Um, and more and more and more over the last two or three years. And what this is saying to me is that the contact is, is escalating, and but we're, it's a learning curve for us also to, to learn how to document trans-dimensional interstellar civilizations and how they might manifest. And there's sort of a tutorial, a sort of a iterative back and forth educational process going on that's wonderful because it's not happening to one person sort of anecdotally. It's happening, you know, to a couple dozen people out under the stars doing this, and um, and that's what happened uh, in the last couple of weeks in the wow. desert of California. And then what we always do is we're leaving. Usually we're out till like one o'clock or one thirty in the morning, and I always we make a circle as we're leaving, and I t uh, ask everyone to invite these extraterrestrial beings and civilizations to come back with them to their room or their house, wherever they're staying. And the first night we went out, we did that, and there was this delightful couple from New York um, who were there, and they had this, um, I believe it was a green and a, and a white sphere, but they were conscious beings that appeared in their room and that were with them there till dawn, till like 5.30 in the morning, uh, communicating with them. And these were extraterrestrial beings that were in this sort of light form, but they were visible with the naked eye. And they could sense that the craft was dematerialized, but outside their uh, hotel room uh, in the desert. And these beings were the ones that they had invited to come back with them. And these were, you know, one of them was a firefighter and one's a police officer. These are very, you know, down-to-earth people. And I think they were just kind of like stunned that that would happen after the first night out making contact. But that's that's what we're, we're finding is happening. And, and I know that in Colorado um, we had a, a, a gentleman, I believe it was in Colorado, who, who did the same thing and asked him to come back. And, and he was sharing a room with another participant and was awakened um, with this ET in the room and the one guy was still sleeping and snoring and there was this ET you could see with his naked eye that was in the room doing energy work with him in consciousness and with the person sleeping and the person sleeping had no recall of it but um, there's a, a amazing contact happening like this that, that continues so it's it's really a 24 hour process because just as the aboriginals taught us a great deal uh, as did the Cherokee about dream time and lucid dreaming uh, when you begin to think about the fact that interstellar civilizations, when they're going faster than the speed of light, are in dimensions that are very closely approximating the lucid astral state of, of that you're in when you have, say, a flying dream. Almost everyone's had a lucid dream where they're flying. Well, that's your body of light, which is real. It's as real as your physical body. In fact, it manifests the physical body, not the other way around. And when you understand the science of consciousness that goes with this, it makes complete sense that these extraterrestrial civilizations that go faster than the speed of light, that are in these other dimensions, 
could, with alacrity and ease, interface with us in our lucid dream state. And uh, contrary, to, to, again, to what Hollywood might portray, the most common way that people have had actual real contact with uh, extraterrestrial civilizations is in that state. And it makes complete sense once you entertain the concept that, gee, you know, how, what is the reality of a trans-dimensional interstellar civilization that's developed enough that they're able to travel from one star system to another at multiples of the speed of light? Well, as soon as you go beyond the speed of light, you're in another dimension. And that the further you go into these other dimensions, the more subtle you begin to realize it's the realms of lucid visual thought and astral body field energy. And that's the form that they're in. And um, this is an amazing concept because it's not even thought about much in, in the whole question of UFOs, but it makes complete sense to anyone who's studied the Vedas or has, has read the uh, understands the puja and the power of consciousness and the science of consciousness, that these civilizations would be traversing space in these other aspects until they choose to fully materialize. And then, of course, it's a solid materialized object and craft, which we've also seen and photographed. But, but you know, it doesn't mean that's the only form they can appear in. It's not an either or. It's both. You know, it's and. Uh, and and I think that that's when you begin to understand that the way that contact can happen is there's almost countless numbers of ways in thought, in the dream state, uh, in, in these lucid sort of experiences, in the meditative state, electronically. In fact, we had uh, someone uh, about a year and a half ago in Florida when we were at another beach location on the Gulf Coast. And it was a terrible kind of blustery cold night, and he decided that he was exhausted because he'd come all the way from Eastern Europe and stayed in, and he asked the ETs to do something. And in his room, there was this beautiful blue sphere that was like this living conscious thing, but it was visible with the naked eye, appeared. And when, and he says, well, if, if you're here, do something that proves to me you're actually – and it went over and turned on his microwave – and the microwave was going. He couldn't get the microwave to stop until he unplugged it. And, uh, and he says, I get it. You're here. So it, these sort of things are just, it, it, it just never ends, the kinds of thousands of ways that these civilizations, once someone says, I'm willing to be a contact diplomat for you and a representative from Earth to you in a peaceful way. And what Jan was saying a moment ago is so important is is that, they're not here to entertain us and do, you know, jump through hoops at SeaWorld or something. Uh, and, you know, they're not our pets. It's a serious undertaking. And they want to see that people are sincerely wanting to have contact to further the cause of universal peace. This huge leap where humanity is going to go from the state it's in now to a peaceful, enlightened civilization that can be interstellar. And that's what we're in the preparatory phase for, and that's really why we're doing this. And and it, 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 it's intimately bound up with the new science of the science of consciousness and transdimensional sciences because – that is the reality of any interstellar civilization. It's, it's a, by definition, if they're getting here, they're going faster than the speed of light. If they're going faster than the speed of light, they're crossing into and have intimate knowledge of everything that's in the Vedas and all the cities, the S-I-D-D-H-I-S of the Vedas, all the accounts of materialization, dematerialization, levitation, uh, precognition, bilocation, you name it. This is something that civilizations that have the ability to go faster than speed of light can do. Now, albeit their technologies are interfacing with consciousness, and their consciousness is interfacing with their technologies. I mean, there is this really highly developed and fine-tuned interface, and I call this TAC and CAT, Consciousness-Assisted Technology and Technology-Assisted Consciousness. And this is described in the training materials. And I think that people, once they understand that interface, it makes complete sense that they could make contact with a contact team such as ours or an individual or small team, uh, such as, you know, we've had people who are now part of this global network who have learned how to do this, and we have a few hundred people on a list that do these coordinated CE5s, Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind, all over the world, and people have amazing experiences even though they're with a team of only three or four, 
qualified people, something like that. And the reason they do is because they understand these. The, it's a really simple concept, and that is uh, the, the the whole con- universe is a conscious quantum hologram that everything is awake, <laughs> all this is that, and that the civilizations that go, go faster than the speed of light and be interstellar understand at least some aspects of that, if not a great deal, certainly more than your average engineer at General Motors um, or Boeing. So uh, I think that this is why understanding the, the science of consciousness is really the foundation of what we're doing. And, and which is also, I think, why the, tech, the, the, the contact protocols work is that they're rooted in this knowledge of the mind and the fact this this essential conscious oneness that is manifesting every individual and that every individual mind is actually in its aspect that is the purest aspect is that universal being. And this then speaks to the philosophy that when you experience that, then an extraterrestrial doesn't seem quote-unquote alien because alien is sort of a pejorative otherness sort of word, separateness. And what you realize is that no matter what the beings may look like, uh, they may be a foot and a half tall or 20 feet tall or they may be this or that, the reality is that they're conscious. And the consciousness whereby they're awake and the consciousness whereby we are all awake is a singularity. And that singularity is really the central protocol, the central reality of what we're doing in our contact work is the experience of that state and then the application of it. And I believe that that's really what they're looking for. When I had contact when I was 18 years old, that, I was told, is why they were interested because you know I had this near-death experience when I was 17 and then on my 18th birthday learned a mantra meditation technique and immediately started having these amazing cosmic awareness experiences and I was up on this mountain in North Carolina and sitting watching the sunset and saw a ET craft and didn't think anything about it materialized and dematerialized and I sat to meditate and at the end of it um, you know I had this amazing cosmic consciousness experience and there was an ET that literally touched me on my right shoulder with its finger and well, the rest of it is in the Hidden Truth Forbidden Knowledge book. I'm not going to go into all of it here, but I had this amazing contact experience. But the reason they were interested, it was nothing special about me per se, it was the fact that here was a human who was interested in this subject, because I had been interested when I was younger, after a sighting I had when I was eight or nine, who was experiencing the universality of mind, which is the central operating system, the central communication system for all interstellar civilizations. Um, it's the science of consciousness and mind and this, this oneness, this infinite being that's shining through all of us. And that's applicable. You can develop protocols and sciences around that. And I, and I think that once we bring out all the new energy physics and anti-gravity and, and uh, devices so we can get off uh, fossil fuels and all this, the, the, big, the big focus after you know, 15, 20, 30 years of that, it's going to be into these areas of science, of consciousness. Yeah, yeah. That's, and really in sum, everyone can do this with practice and the right intent. It's available to all. And interestingly, I did want to point out something that, you know, in the morning we have some meditation time, in the evening we have some meditation time, and one thing that happens every training is that people will get messages, as he said, during that lucid dreaming time, during that hypnagogic kind of time where they're coming out of sleep. It, it, there are amazing contacts with the ETs, and the ETs will give information set, such as a time or something happening, and they'll report it. In fact, later that night, it will happen. Right. Right, and so that's the other thing to understand about the mind is that it's, it's unbounded in space, but it's unbounded in time, and that's how sometimes people can get a glimpse of the future. What we do as a formal training process is actually do the meditation and intend to see what's going to happen that night, and invite the ETs wherever we've decided we're going to go to be there for, when we're going to be there, and 
they do, they are. But frequently, people will get a specific event at a specific time, and amazing correlations to that will be seen and happen. Um, and it's not surprising. Now, that's a, a, an art uh, and a science that has to be developed. But as Jen, as Jen said, everyone can do it. You know, a lot of people turn to me and say, oh, Steve, you know, you just happen to be able to do that. I say, no. You know, I've had people who were like just blue-collar workers that we've trained to do this who become amazing remote viewers and consciousness who are just enormously accurate because they're pure-hearted and they, they don't question that they can do it. And I always say to people, you know, if you think you can't do it, you're not going to be able to. But if you know you can, you will. It's that simple. And then there are some basic techniques to learn, and, and these are in meditation CDs and, and protocols that we've put out. And, you know, for folks who can't join us for a whole week out under the desert and, and sky or wherever we're doing it, uh, you can find out about that at disclosureproject.org. There's a whole a contact training kit that's there, and it has the meditation protocols, the mantra meditation. It has the uh, coherent thought sequencing for expanding mind and communicating with the ET uh, communication systems. It has the tones from the crop circles and the other CSETI events that you get that you can then play. It, it has everything that you would need to, to, do, to know how to do this, except if you want to get a laser or something, and there's, you, know, you can go get one of those um, online. But I, I think that What's exciting is that people have found that they can do this with really not that much uh, effort. It's not like it takes 10 years to develop the skill to do this. I mean, a little bit of effort goes a long way. And the reason it is is because I think the extraterrestrial civilizations, I'm not going to use the word desperate, they're eager to have peaceful contact with enlightened humans. This has been sorely lacking in the last, the modern era of contact. You know, the ancient peoples had contact, certainly. The modern era has been marked too much by militarizing the situation. And so we, they're very excited that there are humans willing to approach this in a way that's peaceful and enlightened. And that's really what we're doing with CSETI. Yeah, yeah. And I do just want to mention one thing before um, we and um, recall that at this past training there was an individual who had been practicing the meditations and he wanted he he had actually seen a certain um, a craft blinking in and out on one of the DVDs that he had gotten prior to the training and he so wanted to see that again and he he entered with at that time that night the right approach and remember we saw exactly. What he wanted, he he told us the next day. That's exactly what I had asked to see. That's right. And he saw it, but he did the work. He did. He practiced. He meditated, and he 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 just did the protocols. They're right there. They're accessible. So um, we would love to hear from other people and your experiences. Yeah. Please send to the CSETI site because we love to hear uh, what people are doing. It is exciting when people begin to experiment with this to report back and uh, anything that, that they have. And, uh, and uh, you know, when, when you can make it, uh, if you want to join us on one of these uh, week-long expeditions, uh, just check the, uh, the site. You can sign up for free at cseti.org um, and disclosureproject.org. And, and you can find out when we're going to be doing these. And um, we're pretty sure we're going to have a, a week expedition in Arizona uh, that uh, – last week, first few days of February and uh, March of 2012, it'd probably be from the uh, 26th of February until the 3rd of uh, March uh, is what we're looking at in 2012 in Arizona. So those of you um, who think you may be interested in that, let us know. And, and we're definitely going to be out on Marco Island uh, again at the on the Gulf of Mexico uh, in April. So I hope to see some of you there. Well, I think we're about up in time here. We've run out of our hour. I can't believe it. But uh, I'd like to thank Dr. Bravo for joining us today. It was a pleasure. And I'd like to thank the folks at the World Puja Network for hosting us here every couple of weeks to bring an update on our journey and consciousness and space together. So keep looking up, and God bless. Bye-bye.